not very often that you get to see two titans of soul on the same bill. Lee Fields and James Hunter both took to the stage at London's Coco venue in January of 2023 for a truly remarkable live show. The two Daptone recording artists spent the afternoon with us, discussing their earlier songwriting, recording and early live performance memories. After watching this conversation, be sure to check out their incredible live videos from that night on the Blues Kitchen YouTube channel. Lee Fields, James Hunter. Hi. Welcome to the Blues Kitchen. The uh, incredibly kind people at Coco have let us kind of come and hang out in their penthouse for the afternoon. So kind of two titans of the soul vocal, an R&B <laughs> vocal, if you like, on one, one, one couch. Go on, give yourself some credit <laughs> as well. Thought it'd be fun to kind of ask you similar questions and kind of see where it goes. But I mean, something I'm curious about for both of you is like when you actually both first found your voice, you know, when you first found yourself singing for the very first time, you know, was it something that came organically? Did you have to try for it or did someone maybe spot it in, in you? I, 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 I kind of delved for it. I tried to get it by copying loads of people, you know, so it was a conscious effort to try and sing that way. It never came natural at all. Uh, it was, uh, uh, we had singing lessons at school, you know, that kind of thing, and I had no interest in it whatsoever until I found the kind of music that I, I like, and that's when mm. I started what you might call studying, what I, what I call theft, really. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And what about you, Lee? When did you kind of, kind of first discover that you had a voice? In the beginning, uh, my intention was, wasn't to be a, uh, a singer. I wanted to be a businessman. I was a paper boy, uh, delivering papers. But I always used to listen to all of the latest records on, on uh, that was playing on radio. And this movie came out, The Tammy Show, mm -hmm. and it featured James Brown, and everybody said I had an uncanny resemblance. One night they had a talent show, which I knew all of the songs on radio. Uh, Leslie Gore, uh, Beach Boys, uh, Chuck Berry, James Brown, Sam Cooke, all of them. But, I, but uh, my intention was, wasn't to be a singer. So my friend dared me up to, to go on stage and sing. So I took him up on his dare <laughs> and I did a James Brown tune and the girls like went crazy. And, uh, and the band <laughs> hired me to be that singer. Brilliant. To be that singer and, uh, and they were paying me a lot more than when I was making, delivering papers, you know. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> so ever since then I've been singing. You mentioned as well, um, you kind of had aspirations to like work with Paperboy, I assume. I want to be a businessman. A businessman, yeah. Now, I, this is a little bit loaded because I, I think I know what your first job was, but, but like, if we go back even further, what were your first jobs before you were even in music? Do you remember? I, I was a paper boy. Oh, you actually were a paper boy and you yeah. wanted to be the boss, basically. Yeah, yeah I, want, I wanted to, uh, to be, a, you know, I was like 13, so I wanted to, uh, you know, because people of color where I live in North Carolina was very few opportunities at that time. My theme was being a businessman. And but when I had got to deal with the band, I didn't know it was gonna last this long. It just <laughs> went from year to year to year to year and it never stopped. And if we back up a bit as well, you James, am I right in thinking, did you work on the trains or yes, something? Yes, I was a railwayman, yeah. yeah I, yeah. I worked on the uh, on the eastern region, around yeah. Colchester. I was uh, my job. <clears throat> First off, I because uh, I was only seventeen when I joined. I left school at sixteen, and uh, I, I, the only job I was uh, old enough to do was a trainee technician. You, you, like an apprenticeship, you had to go right. to college. So I did that, and I failed all my courses <laughs> until I was old enough to become an assistant technician. Right. And that was uh, working underneath the signal boxes with the interlocking system for the old, you know, with the old yeah. uh, semaphore signals. Yeah. You know, and oh, was, so you're actually the guy changing the signals. I, I wasn't and all the signalman. I was the bloke maintaining the <laughs> interlocking system. Right. That prevent. It's all Victorian <laughs> technology. It's right. beautiful stuff, but it's all to prevent what uh, conflicting signals from being pulled. Yeah. So right. one will lock the other and stop that. Yeah. But there's all this 
tappets and dies and things in this tray. And it's so hopelessly complicated that all I could do was hold the spanners for the other fella to do it. <laughs> it was like, you know, it was like a Heath Robinson drawing or Rube Goldberg, you know, it was, all, that stuff was all, it's just beautiful to look at, you know, but I, just, I couldn't get to grips with any of it. So I just used to go and make the tea. <laughs> <laughs> so time on the railway, obviously time as a paper boy, you then find your voices. Um, what about your first songs? You know, when did you first put pen, pen to paper? The first actual, I'm going back a lot of years, the first actual <laughs> recording was Bewildered. Okay. Out of, um, on Bedford Records, out of New York. Because I went to New York at 17. You know, you, some people say, oh man, you're good. you're good, you need to come to New York, you need to come to New York. And that's what I did. And do you remember the, the days in the studio and, and what it kind of felt like going into that room and hearing your voice back for the first time? Yeah, it was like, it was strange, you know, because you know, I never heard myself, you know, like, on a level like that. And people would say, hey man, this sounds good. You know, I was, it was, I was listening to what the people were saying. Cause I, as far as myself is concerned, I, uh, I don't know whether I'm sounding good or whether I'm, how I'm sounding, only thing I know, I watch the people. Or they like me, say it like this, so I say it like that. Okay. And I just keep on doing it. Yeah. And, and watch the people response. When they don't, if I don't get that much response doing something, it's time for me to take it up somewhere, take it to another, in another direction. You make it sound so simply, but I think so many people miss that point. You know, it's like, what's the reaction? It's you know, all about the people. Yeah, of course, and the connection that you're going to make. Because if I'm singing something, and I'm quite sure James will agree, if you're singing something and I'm the only one feeling it, hey, I'm doing something wrong. Yes, if, yes. Yeah, if you look at it and see, see him feeling it, well, okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to stay in gear like this for a minute. And if I see, <laughs> <laughs> if I see, uh, now it's time to do something else. And the crowd are responding better. Just follow those. She's the feedback from the fo audience. Follow yeah, the, yeah. the audience all night long. Of course. What about you, James? The first time you kind of put pen to paper and got your own tune down? Well, I had a what do you call it, I had an incentive to write my first song. It was, I was 22 and I used to sit in with this uh, busking band, these rockabilly mm. fellas. They used to go out on the streets in Colchester. And one day they got this offer to go up and do um, a, uh, a record on a compilation album that Boz Bora from the Polecats, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. late of the Polecats at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and later of uh, Morrissey's band. Yeah. He was producing this thing, and because I used to ha sit in with them, they invited me along. So the proviso was, you had to write your own song, and I'd never written anything. So I write this thing called Evil Eye, first song I ever wrote. I was 22, and it was a sort of Muddy Waters pastiche. Right. It was like a comedy version of what something Muddy Waters yeah. might have, like yeah, I'm okay. Ready or something, but with slightly more comic yeah. lyrics, you know. Yeah. We went and put that down, and then we didn't know it was going to whether it's going to be, you know, but we, we found out it was actually going to be commercially released. Mm. And that was, that was pretty exciting. Yeah. You know, that, was, that was the first thing I ever, ever put out. Fantastic. But yeah. And I suppose kind of bringing it up to present day, you're both releasing records once again with, with that tone. Yeah. Which really, alongside I think Coal Mine and a few other labels, really very much the kind of modern mm. home of, of soul music. Yeah. So I'm interested to know what your experience of making records is, because everything's moved from New York now, hasn't it? And Gabe's got a place out in Riverside, yeah. California. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to know what your experiences are of working with Gabe and the process of working with that team and, and all the incredible musicians out on the West Coast in, in, in LA. You want to take that, Jeff? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, with working with Gabe, we, we were the, my band was the first one to break in that um, place in Riverside, you know, we were the you're guinea, the guinea pigs. pigs, right? We were, and um, we'd never been to the uh, the Brooklyn one. Never I'd seen it, I think, but mm. we'd never been there. My God, it was just even the first playback without him doing putting any catch up on at all. It just glorious. It just the, the horns sounded really three dimensional. You didn't have to mess about with anything to get it. It already sounded. It, it was kind of like mix proof. You, you, it already sounded like a record, even dry. Yeah, that's a because of the size room. of the yeah the acoustics of the room and Gabe he's so clever I mean he knows yeah. he he's one of them you know that he knows what he's talking about because he demystifies everything yeah. he boils it down to simple he goes well it's where you put the mic 
That's yeah. all. You get... <laughs> Yeah. Some people, I've met producers who go, oh, well, you know, that's a secret. I don't tell anyone this. Or they get all cagey. Guy don't. He says, no, you just get all the frequencies out of each other's way. If you're playing one frequency and so is the bass player, you go up an octave and, get, you know, so yeah, you find everything space. sounds up front. It's so, he just tells you how simple it is. Yeah. He's amazing. He's great, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And what was the experience? I mean, Sentimental Fool that you've just released is... Arguably, maybe your finest record to date, Lee. I mean, congratulations oh, on a brilliant record. I'm looking well, forward I, to hearing the tunes live. But tell me about the, the making of that in that same studio. Well, I attribute that to Gabe. Uh, you know, as um, James stated, he he knows exactly what he's doing. He's 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 a master at recording, and uh, he built this room. Um, just like he wanted to build it. And what I did was came in and just try to fit in. Yeah. And um, I'm so appreciative that everybody's um, gravitating to the album. But I would attribute that to Gabe, definitely. I think, kind of speaking simplistically, over the years, you know, it's not very often that music fans follow a, a label. You know, yeah. and in the 60s, you might have followed Motown or Stax or yeah. both. Yeah. And they both had a very definite sound. Yeah. And that tone, obviously, is slightly indebted to, to those labels. But it's really interesting that here in 2023, they very much have a signature sound. And now, because they've been going for, what, 20, 25 years yeah. or something now? Yeah. That there's almost like a whole new scene that's come off the back of that soul sound as well. So it's like... Yes, there's a foot in the past and very much kind of doth of the cap to... That's probably what comes great, of the sort of the ethos of those old records, that you, they're doing the same, you know, the method yeah. and the same spirit. They, they, that's going to happen. You know, your, your, um, the, the, the sound that you strive for is going to become your sort of signature. And he's, they've definitely got their own identity, haven't they? Definitely. As a, you know, as a sound. You know, there's so many uh, up-and-coming recording labels that um, are following his, his the Daptone uh, vibe. Yeah. And I hear a lot of stuff on radio today, you can tell that they were influenced yeah. by, by, by Daptone. I mean, I attribute it to Gabe. Gabe desire his energy. I mean, the guy, I mean, we're still recording in the morning at nine o'clock. And like, we finish up at five o'clock in the evening every day. I mean, and then he goes home, play with his kids, play a little basketball with his son and, you know, That's communicate true. with his family. And, <laughs> and uh, the next day, he's up early in the morning, ready to do it again. Fantastic. He never runs out of energy. The guy is like, um, he's like that, that bunny. Uh, with the, uh, with the <laughs> battery. Yeah, the energizer. Jurisha. Jurisha. Oh, we're not <laughs> Might be we can say what we want on here, don't worry. <laughs> we're sat here in London, and it's the first night of your joint tour. You're on the road for, is it three dates to get yes, yes, kind of Yeah, three dates, right. right. It's the it's UK tour, tour yeah. isn't it? And is it, is it fair to say it's almost like a little bit of a soul review kind of tour? I mean, I are, are, yeah. you, are you yeah, sharing you can, a band you can say that. Yes, yes. You For are. reasons of economy, I've stolen Lee's. Uh, <laughs> Let's romanticise it, you know, we, like a true we, Stacks Vault review tour or something like that. That's right. What I'm, what I'm hoping for is just everybody just have an extremely good time, <laughs> you know? An extremely good time. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So what can we expect tonight then, guys? Hopefully, uh, people just feel the spirit and just have a good time. Let themselves loose and, you know? And do what they do. If the magic happens, it'll be a night that people will be talking about for a long time. Which I'm pleased to be working with James Hunter here. And he's gonna bring it. He's gonna <laughs> bring it. <laughs> so I know I know it's gonna be nice. What's next for the two of you? I mean, kind of in another part of you, maybe a record together at some point? Or? That would be nice. I would I'm willing. Mind that, I would yeah. love to. I would love to. You heard it here first, everyone? Yeah. yeah. I would love to. But yeah, I suppose it would be good to know, like, what are your plans for, or future recording plans? Have you got records in the works? Well, I'm, uh, what do you call it, I've, uh, I've got a bunch of songs now, you mm -hmm. know, all ready to go, demoed them up, you know. I've, I've done it on my little portable home studio. Have you? Uh, they're, they're showing that I'm really 
really pleased with how they're coming up. So we're going to get on the dap tone and see about getting those recorded. Head over to Riverside, California and get them down oh, on yeah, tape. Definitely. And I, I, I kind of don't want to put too much pressure on Lee because you've just put out a fantastic record. But is there talk about getting back in the studio? Not at the moment. Uh, we, we're just uh, touring with the record and uh, promoting the new record. Yeah. But, but it's always ideas, you know. So when I come up with ideas, I jot it down. And, um, and uh, so to make sure that when we roll on the next uh, album, it'll be something fresh, something new, and hopefully something exciting. So, you know, but that's where, that's where it is right now. The main thing as of now is, is the um, Sentimental Fool album. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Lee. Truly appreciate it. Thanks James, for having us. what Cheers. a pleasure to host both of you. Have a great show tonight. Thank Hope you. So. Hope so. Subscribe to The Blues Kitchen for live performances and interviews with the hottest blues, soul, country and roots musicians in the world today.